tradition that every president leaves a message or a little gift of some kind uh, in the desk here in the Oval Office. And I wondered if you'd given any thought to what you might leave behind for George Bush. A gift in the, in the Oval Office? Or here? a note or something. Mm. Oh, I had thought maybe that I'd leave a little note in the desk drawer for him. And to what find. might it say? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't completely worked that out. Just ideas going through my mind, and I'd, I'll have to wait and see what I write down. I wanted to ask you about one of the problems that's, uh, that you've thought a lot about over the last eight years, the problem of hostages. You'll probably be in a position of leaving, offices, leaving office with nine Americans still being held hostage in Lebanon. How much does that bother you? And do you wish, in retrospect, you might have pursued a slightly different strategy, maybe a more high-profile strategy for getting them released? I don't know what more we could have done. Uh, no, we didn't. In fact, we kept very quiet about it because we thought there was a better chance uh, with all of the various things that we explored in trying. Yes, it preys very heavily on, on me and has from the time that they were taken hostage. I think it's one of the cruelest, most cowardly barbaric things uh, that any group of people can do. And to those who have taken them, I feel that way. I hope and pray if, uh, if it can't be us, that it can soon be the next administration that will see them come home. Do you wish, though, that maybe you had made it a more high profile issue? Uh, no. It's a, it's a very touchy and ticklish thing. It's a case of of if you try to explore the idea of rescue, you don't know where and you don't know but what you could cause the execution of them by attempting any such thing. Mr. President, I wonder if you could reveal your private thoughts on one subject now that you're just uh, a few days from leaving. <coughs> if uh, the Constitution hadn't prohibited it, would you have run for a third term or have you had enough? I haven't really thought of, of, about that because from the very first, you. You knew that it was impossible, so it didn't enter my mind. Uh, and I can't put myself in that position now, but I can tell you what I feel about that amendment. Now that no one could accuse me of thinking this for myself or my own benefit, I feel that that, never mind the individual who was holding the presidency at the time, that is an infringement on the democratic rights of the American people. This is the only office that is chosen by all the people. And I think they have a right to vote for whoever they want to vote for and for as long. You have people 30 and 40 years sitting up in the legislature. What is so different that says to the people, oh, no, you can't do that for this office? Mr. President, I know, just to follow that up briefly if I could, uh, it was Roosevelt, of course, who broke the pattern of the, of the two-term limit. Yeah. Uh, have you consciously, in many ways, emulated uh, or copied uh, his presidency? I mean, you've sometimes been compared with him in terms of optimism and that sort of thing. Have you mm -hmm. patterned yourself after him in any way? No. I've, over the years and in long before I ever thought of public life, but when I was out there on the, as I've called it, the mashed potato circuit and speaking on the things that I believed in, I came here with a pretty set program in my mind of what government should be and what it was intended to be by the Founding Fathers and where it had violated those precepts and my determination to change it. Now, on the other hand, having voted for Franklin Delano Roosevelt four times, because I was a Democrat, my first vote at age 21 was cast for him. Uh, there is a similarity. There's been some great changes, not in people, but in parties. Franklin Roosevelt, when I voted for him, had a pro platform of reducing federal spending by 25 percent, uh, returning to states and local governments and to the people authority and autonomy that had been unjustly seized by the federal government and the elimination of useless boards and commissions. Well, now, which side today uh, is at home <laughs> with that, that type of program? Ours, not the party that he was representing at that time. And uh, I've called attention to that uh, uh, a few times. Mr. President, uh, when you and I were growing up, the situation in America concerning immigrants was quite different. We had a different kind of immigrant coming into this country. Now, 
we have an explosion of immigrants from countries yes. like Mexico. We have uh, immigrants from Central America. And they bring a different set of problems. They fit into the American society differently. I'd like for you to talk about your view of America with these new immigrants and their role in shaping America into the future. Well, I think what maybe you've brought up is a subject that immigrants, to me, I, I've always believed that, uh, that the Lord put this great continent here for those people, wherever they may be in the world, who had a special love for freedom and the courage to uproot themselves, leave family and friends, and come to this country to start a new life. And I still believe that this country should offer that. But what has caused this kind of new uh, immigrant, as you call them, are they're refugees in the search for democracy that's going on in the world and the development. These are people that are fleeing from threats to their lives, to their freedom, and so forth in these various other countries. And I know that this can bring about a problem in which you can say, can any one country? We've always offered a, a refuge. We've always had uh, and set quotas of refugees that we were willing to take. But do, do we come to a point in which we just plain can't, can't handle them? Which doesn't that then say that what we should be doing is even more in trying to replace totalitarianism and persecution with democracy in these other countries to where they won't have to be refugees? What steps, as you leave office, do you recommend to your successor in either making sure they don't leave some of those countries or in handling them in places like Miami now uh, in the event they do reach this country? Well, again, as I say, we must, we must do everything we can uh, to offer humane treatment to these people who are legitimate refugees from persecution. And uh, yet at the same time, as I say, I think that we must step up our efforts to uh, reduce the need uh, that, that refugees have are by America, what? Indo Chinese, the Salvador, and no, the Nicaragua. As I say, in, in those countries, uh, to do everything we can to continue the spread of democracy. Well, is it good for them to be here in this country? Do you welcome them with open arms? Should they be here? Are they doing good things for America? Well, I think, I think not only should we welcome them, but I think there is an, an, uh, an area where we should also collaborate with uh, our allies and other democracies to make sure that everybody is doing their bit in this, that maybe we're going to have to redirect refugees uh, to other countries that are also willing, willing to take them. Which countries? Uh, <laughs> well, as I say, all the democracies uh, should recognize a responsibility in this, but the real responsibility is to eliminate the things that make them. For example, I have talked to the leader of one country where persecution is based on, on a religious factor. And, uh, the, and yet there is a reluctance to let them go. Uh, all manner of things, uh, that they can't afford the loss of the manpower or anything of this kind. And I once said, well, isn't the real answer to your problem then not the keeping by force of people are trying to go, but to allow those people the religious freedom in which they won't need to be refugees, they won't be seeking exit from your country? I didn't get an answer, but... Which country? Which uh, leader? Well, since I may be still asking that question, no, I won't name the country and the leader. Mr. President, I have two questions about Central America. Um, what can the Bush administration do and what should it do to redeem your pledge to keep the Contras alive and as a fighting force against Marxism 
And aren't they doomed now to live in exile uh, as uh, sort of on American care packages? Well, we haven't changed our mind about the need to help those people, and I'm quite sure that I can't speak for the Vice President, but I know that he's been a part of all these things that we've been doing here. But again, we come down to the problem of the division here in our own government of a Congress that refuses to acknowledge that need for those freedom fighters, and thus, in a way, is on the side of, of the uh, Sandinistas in Central America and who are uh, who have a totalitarian state. And I've never been able to understand it. There's no question but that the Sandinistas have mounted over several years a very potent disinformation program. For example, one day there arrived on my desk a slick paper magazine, a beautifully produced magazine, produced in Berkeley, California. And it was a program, it was a magazine of straight propaganda by the Sandinistas. And when you came in there to that card that is in every magazine about how you can subscribe, the card in that magazine said, to whichever reader was reading it, said, here are the instructions as to how you can get this magazine in the hands of your congressman or senator and urging them to subscribe for congressmen and senators. But there's division right now up there in the Hill, not only just on the Contras, but within the other party, which has, whose leadership has opposed us on this Contra aid from the very beginning. There are members of that party, people in the Congress, who have journeyed down to Nicaragua to see for themselves and who have avoided the Potemkin village policy of the Sandinistas and have come back having seen for themselves the persecution of the people. And uh, so that they are immune to this. Uh, well, let me give you an example, just personal experience. I read a story in the press about a bishop in this country who had gone down there and who in his story told them of how he had led a group of refugees up across the Honduran border who were fleeing the Nicaraguan government. And the story said that on the way they were attacked by the Contras and rescued by the Sandinistas. Well, I made it a point of tracking down by phone when he had returned to this country. And that's how the story came out, to track him down in the phone and told him I had read the story and what he had said about this attack and evidently he hadn't read the story because he said to me, no, that's just the opposite. We were attacked by the Sandinistas and rescued by the Contras. The second question was, should the United States abide by the treaty with Panama that requires us to turn the canal over to them in 10 years' time if, as long as General Noriega remains in power? Well, I know that that is a, a subject that I think we should be treating with, and of course it's too late for me now to be treating with it, but uh, I think it is something definitely to look at because uh, our attempts to, to oust him, I think, were in line with the thinking of a great many people in Panama, and there's no question about his totalitarianism, and also uh, I don't think there's any way to escape the fact that uh, he's a part of the, uh, the drug fraternity. So um, it's going to be, I'm, let me just say that uh, based on whatever the situation is, uh, I think that's something that should be taken into consideration by whoever is in charge at that time. Mr. President, uh, you said in a recent uh, television interview that, that there have been times in this office when I've wondered how you could do the job if you hadn't been an actor. Uh, I, I'd like, uh, if you could, to, to, to say what, explain what you meant by that, and, just, and if you could give us an example of, of a time or two where, where, where being an actor was especially beneficial to you as president. Well, what I had in mind when I said that is not that you learn something in the acting profession that uh, could be helpful to sitting at that desk. What I, was, what I really meant was there's a kind of a comparison 
Back in the golden days of Hollywood, when there were the major studios and the stars were under contract and studios and salaries and so forth, the publicity about uh, Hollywood was such that there was a kind of uh, looking down as if we were uh, uh, not quite good citizens and so forth. And uh, uh, there was public uh, portrayals and so forth uh, were, were quite critical. That was one thing that's similar to what happens uh, here. Uh, and the second thing was, and incidentally, uh, that was, wasn't deserved. Because back in that era, this is part of what I started making speeches about when I was president of the Screen Actors Guild. Divorce, that we were supposed to be just people out there that were marrying and divorcing on a whole scale manner. You know that the divorce rate for Hollywood was lower than the national average. But there were a few people who were guilty of this multiple marriage concept. And uh, the portrayal then and the public acceptance and even the media treatment uh, didn't look up the fact, but just gave that general impression. And uh, then there was the other thing. The, in that day of so many fan magazines, more than there are today, and of the press, major press having uh, movie reviewers to review f pictures. Uh, we put up with an awful lot of critical reviews that I think were unjustified. I was in a picture that I think is the best picture I've ever been in, that in many times has been listed as one of the 10 best movies. And that movie was King's Row. Out of the 53 movies I did, that one probably received the worst treatment from the movie critics of any picture that I was ever in. They just, uh, I can remember one term that was used, that it was a picture about people you wouldn't want to know <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, things of that kind. So this is what I meant, that uh, it didn't come as a shock to me to um, read columns or editorials <coughs> or uh, uh, hear criticisms of, and uh, this same kind of thing. I'd lived with that for more than a quarter of a century in, in uh, Hollywood. Well, if I could follow up, I remember when you first ran for governor of California, the, the, uh, uh, you had to answer a lot of questions about whether you were just uh, uh, an actor who had, had memorized uh, your lines or whether you, mm -hmm. could, you, could, uh, uh, you could handle the job of being governor of California. Do, do, do you think that this is kind of a two-part question? Do you think you were underestimated because you were an actor? And, do, oh, yes. and, and is there some way in which being an actor really did, uh, beyond this business that you, you, were, you had, had been criticized and you knew what that was like, was there some way that it helped you in, in your work, in, your, in, your, in campaigning or in, uh, in, uh, uh, or in any way? Well, it's what made me think of that thing that I've just been discussing about saying, uh, uh, once in the job, looking back and saying, uh, could I have done it if I hadn't already been subjected to this and uh, was able to tolerate and live with it? Um, the, as I say, I don't think, I know I'd be taking up your time here with something, but many years ago, something happened, an actor did something, and the media, it was out of line, and the media jumped on it, but not only on the individual. The attack was widespread that on all the people of that profession and said that the entertainers, the performers, uh, that they were childish in their ways, complete children in their attitudes, and doing childish things as a result of this one misdeed by somebody. And it remained for one journalist Irving S. Cobb, to write a column rebuking his colleagues on this. And I thought he did it rather well. He said about this being childish, he said, children, he said, if this be true, and if it also be true that when we approach the final curtain, that all men must bear in their arms that which they have given in life. 
the people of show business will march in the procession, carrying in their arms the pure pearl of tears, the gold of laughter, and the diamonds of stardust they spread on what might otherwise have been a rather dreary world. And when they reach the final stage door, the keeper will say, open, let my children in. I kind of liked Cobb for that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, in the eight years you've been president, there's been a remarkable change in the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union, much of which some people say is attributable to you and being tough in the beginning and then being willing to meet with Mr. Gorbachev. Can you retrospectively look back and see from your personal standpoint what it is you think inside you that changed or what changed in Mr. Gorbachev and what advice would you give Mr. Bush in terms of his future dealings with the Soviet Union? And secondly, looking at some of the criticism you've still received for having brought us to this point, say from George Will, who's a conservative, or Bill Sapphire, who say just recently that you will not go into the, the halls of the great presidents chiefly because you embraced Mr. Gorbachev too quickly. Hmm. Have I embraced him too quickly? What harm has been done? He's reduced his forces. We have the first treaty that the Soviets have ever signed in which they agreed to destroy weapons they already had. No, I came here with a belief that some of the previous efforts to meet with the Soviets who had, we must recall, the previous Soviet leaders had an expansionist philosophy. Every one until the present one had at some time or other reiterated before the great Soviet Congress and so forth that their duty must be a one world communist state. That this must be the goal to not just be communist where they were, but to spread it throughout the world. And in many of the attempts and the so-called detente and so forth of previous efforts, I thought it was the wrong track. And I believed, uh, and I thought that I was something of a student of this because in Hollywood we faced our own international crisis right after World War II when a number of our unions had actually been invaded and taken over by communists. And there was a great effort by virtue of a jurisdictional strike to gain economic control of the picture business for propaganda purposes. And that was at a time when 75% of the playing time of all the theaters of the world was taken up by Hollywood made motion pictures. And having had that experience and studied enough to know that I was speaking fact when I said that the Soviet Union, that the leaders had openly expressed to their people the right to lie and cheat and steal if it, if it furthered socialism. And I came with a belief that peace could only come about through strength. Do you still have total faith in SDI, the Star Wars, as a, as a uh, practical and achievable method? Of Before you go to that, though, could you go on and whether you're well, a let me finish with this or and, not and, because of embracing and I will. And Let me just, just say that uh, I came here with that belief. Now, under the previous administration, our allies had asked for help because they became aware that the Soviets had targeted all the major cities of Europe with the intermediate range nuclear weapon. And they asked for help from this country. Well, time ran out in the previous administration, uh, and it fell to us, and we evolved the plan of putting in the Pershings and the cruise missiles, in other words, intermediate range weapons on our side as a deterrent to them using theirs against Europe. And in the negotiations that had been going on and the talks between our two countries, uh, the Soviets, oh, they were wild in their objections about us putting those weapons into Europe. And this was when I proposed then, well, all right, zero, zero. You take yours away and we'll take ours away. And we won't put any more in. We won't complete what we're, we've started. And they walked out of the meetings. 
in protest. This, this was in Geneva. They just walked out. And we proceeded to put in the, the Pershings and the, and the cruise missiles as a deterrent. And uh, quite some time later, they contacted us, said they wanted to talk about this situation. Mm -hmm. And they used our own term. Mm -hmm. They wanted to discuss zero, zero mm -hmm. on intermediate range weapons. So you felt vindicated at that point, and, and then you would leave well, office now feeling that not only was the right thing to do, but well, you would advise Mr. Bush to It was the right thing to do. The, there wasn't any question, but that, that's why they came back once they were targeted themselves with intermediate range weapons. Uh, they came back and were willing to talk, and the talk resulted in a treaty in which we have eliminated those weapons. But the one thing that I must say about no change in me, and even though I have found Gorbachev to be apparently quite different than the three leaders who were here for uh, before he came during my term, he, they kept dying on me. Uh -huh. And uh, there wasn't very much chance to talk to them, although I, did, I had had meetings with some of them and talked, but they were still addicted to that expansionist philosophy. Then when it turned and and they came back and on this treaty, and we then opened up the START Treaty, which was on another type, which is still going on, on another type of weapon. But this was not suddenly me uh, saying, oh, everything is fine. Uh, that's why I used that one Russian expression that I kept using in all the negotiations with Mr. Gorbachev. Dovayai no provayai, which means trust but verify. And this, in previous attempts at treaties, had always been the great problem, was to get agreement on their side to allow verification of terms. Well, does it hurt you well, that now, conservatives have yeah. criticized you for saying that you embrace Gorbachev too quickly and therefore diminishes your place in greatness and history? They're wrong. They're wrong because I am not, and even to this day, I am I'm motivated by deeds, not just words. And the deeds have been there. We have the verification to an extent that I don't think anyone had ever dreamed would have been possible. We've got literally hundreds of officers and military personnel in their country in positions to, uh, to verify. They have the same here now with our, us. Do you, do you expect them to have such deep, to do, to do something about the Sandinistas or about Cuba? Do you, do you expect the, this, this new attitude that you see in, in Mr. Gorbachev to be translated into the Soviet Union taking any kind of a different position in terms of arming uh, uh, its countries or the countries that uh, it's allied with in this hemisphere? Well, the, on that we do the same thing in some other countries where we're helping to spread democracy too, but we are still negotiating. We haven't, everything isn't a hundred percent as yet, but I must say the progress that we've made the, uh, and, and particularly in human rights, which has been at the base of most of our, our dealings with him, the change there is, is beyond anything they've ever done before. I know he's telling me that we're out of time. Mr. Uh, President, uh, are you going to do any movie but, roles? Uh, are you going to go back to the movies? No, I think that would look like trying to cash in on this honorable position. No, I don't uh, think what that... What is your speaking for you, speaking of what? cashing in? If you, if you what? Oh, no, I'll see what's out there in the market. I don't even know what haircuts cost anymore. <laughs> but your question, SDI. Yes, we have to go forward with SDI. But I Dr. think that... Teller S is not wrong. What? Dr. Teller is, is not wrong. That, uh, oh, no. I, I, I believe in that. This is... I believe, and I have actually heard... Soviet officials repeat these words himself. A nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Nuclear war is contrary to all the rules of warfare that we all subscribe to about World War I and so forth with regard to the safety of civilians. Nuclear war, the target is civilian. The wiping out of cities and so forth. And uh, so I think that uh, is my idea at the very, very beginning when I first came here. I had a meeting with the Joint Chiefs and 
asked her if they believed it was possible to conceive of a weapon, a defensive weapon, there's always been a defensive weapon for every other weapon invented, that could start eliminating these weapons if they were ever used as they came out of their silos. And they asked for a few days. They came back in a few days and said, yes, they believed that such a thing could be considered. And I said, we'll start. <laughs> Thank you. Have your work cut out. We're going to have your work cut out for you on this gerrymandering when you go back on the mashed potato circuit in California. The what? Gerrymandering. Uh, district lines, the Supreme Court said the California case was okay. I have to correct everybody. It's gerrymandering. G-E-R-R-Y. All right. Gary Mandering. Yes, that's going to be part of my... I, that I'm going to be after. Mm -hmm. Because this has been going on for half a century. But the Supreme Court said uh, yesterday, hey, the California redistricting was fine. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, it belongs to the states. Jerry. I'm going to yeah. try to Jerry. convince the 